and welcome to the fall edition of Currents, Ocean TV 20's hotspot for everything OCC. I'm your host, Sarah Rivello. At Currents, we'll give you the latest on all the events happening on campus, as well as profiles of students and student life at Ocean County College. We have the latest on OCC's developmental courses, which will help first-year students achieve core academic skills, such as numeracy and literacy. These skills, which are at times underdeveloped among K-12 postgraduates, will help students succeed in the professional world. We'll be talking to a remedial mathematics professor, as well as two remedial English professors, who will give us an insight into their teaching techniques and how their courses help build a solid foundation for their college experience. Later, we'll bring in the latest details on NJCAA's Women's National Soccer Tournament, which will be hosted at OCC's state-of-the-art soccer stadium this November. We'll be talking with the college athletic director as well as the executive director about this exciting upcoming event. But first, with me is Professor Jill Zakarczyk, who teaches developmental mathematics as well as survey of math at OCC. Hello, and welcome to our show. Hi, Sarah. So, what is remedial mathematics? Well, the purpose of remedial mathematics is to help students who are either lacking or weak in their algebra skills develop these sk skills so that they can advance into higher level college math classes. Okay, and how long has it been at Ocean County College? OCC has offered remedial math classes for around 50 years, which is pretty much since the inception of the college. Okay, and how many levels are there of developmental mathematics? There are two courses currently offered at Ocean County College. The first is Math 011, which is Introduction to Algebra 1, and the second is Math 012, which is Introduction to Algebra 2. That's very interesting. So how did you first begin teaching, or what is your, what is your background in education? Well, I always wanted to be a teacher. It's something I wanted to do ever since I was a child. Originally, I wanted to be an elementary school teacher. Uh, as I was pursuing my bachelor's degree in elementary education, I realized that I was able to do and understand math much better than a lot of my fellow classmates. Consequently, I earned a teaching certificate in mathematics as well as a master's degree in math. While I was pursuing my master's degree in math, I had a graduate teaching assistantship which involved teaching remedial math. This was the point when I realized that I enjoyed this type of teaching and that teaching college level classes was a better fit for me. That's great. So how long have you been working at Ocean County College? I've been working at Ocean County College for 28 years. I am a lifelong teacher and almost all of my career has been spent at Ocean County College. So that's great. So you have a lot of experience. Um, so with that said, Professor Jill, why do you think developmental courses are important and how does math translate into everyday success? How does it help students to reach their, their goals? Well, developmental courses are important because many of the students, as I've already mentioned, come into college underprepared. They are in no way ready to move into a higher level math class. They are lacking the skills that they need to be successful in those classes. Think of developmental math in terms of building blocks. When you're building with blocks, you lay down a strong foundation to support the higher levels. Mm -hmm. In the same way, developmental math teaches students the skills they need that will support their learning in the higher level courses. Okay, so what do you think the biggest difference is between college level remedial mathematics as opposed to similar high school courses? I would have to say that the content is pretty much the same in both types of courses. What differs is the accountability of the student. Mm -hmm. When a student is in high school, they're pretty much being coddled, told what to do. Once they move to the college setting, they are now accountable and responsible for their own learning mm -hmm. and for their own outcomes. With some help, but for the most part, they are accountable for their own learning. So remedial math tends to have a negative connotation among students. So can you comment on that? Well, a lot of students come into remedial math classes with very negative feelings. They're feelings of frustration, anger, um, 
discouraged, some of them feel embarrassed, and a lot of this stems from fear. It could either be fear from having never learned the subject or having struggle, struggled with the subject for many, many years. It's our job as remedial math teachers to make these students feel comfortable and be patient with them so that they can overcome these fears and learn the material that will help them move on to higher level courses. So what type of teaching techniques do you utilize or implement in the classroom to promote student success and to motivate these developmental students? Well, I try to make my students feel comfortable in the class. I'm patient with them. Uh, but as far as actual concrete techniques, one technique that I use that a lot of students really appreciate is try your own example. After I teach a lesson and do several examples on the board, I will give the students an example to try on their own at their desk. I give them a few minutes and then I will circulate throughout the classroom to see how they're doing. If they don't get it or if they got something wrong, I'll either help them figure out what they did wrong or ask them for their input as to what they think they're doing wrong. On the other hand, if someone gets the question correct, I'll give them a pat on the back because it makes them feel good. They now understand that they know what they're doing. So it benefits all students, those who know what they're doing and those who don't know what they're doing. Excellent. So how, what do you see as the ideal? What is the ideal student to you? Well, the ideal student is a student who is motivated to learn, who comes to class prepared, who pays attention, and who wants to be there and wants to succeed so that they can advance to higher levels. And why do you think there are some students who dislike math so much, as opposed to some students who seem to like it and flourish at it? Well, I think the fact that so many people dislike math really stems from their history with math. Mm -hmm. If they were young and they were struggling with math or they were discouraged or they just didn't have a good teacher, students who were confident and were encouraged in their younger years seemed to do better in math. Students who struggled with it in the early years just don't seem to do as well. And it just keeps building up and building up and building up. That is reflected in their attitudes now. So what resources are there available on campus for students who are seeking help, specifically in the remedial um, mathematics courses? Well, there are a variety of resources available to all math students. Specifically for the remedial math students, there are online video lessons that are actually taught by OCC professors. So if a student misses a class or just doesn't quite understand the content of, that they learned in class, they can review these videos at any time. A very valuable resource is the Mathematics Center. The Mathematics Center is located in the Russell Building, which is Building 10, Room 123. The Mathematics Center provides tutoring for all OCC students that are registered in a math class. Okay. Students can go to the Mathematics Center if they need help with exam prep, concepts they don't understand, homework help. There is no appointment necessary to visit the Mathematics Center and the fee is included in the cost of tuition. So where do you see the future of um, the remedial mathematics program at Ocean County College? I believe that developmental mathematics is here to stay and its enrollment will more than likely increase over the upcoming years. Students still come in underprepared, if, if anything, more so than they used to. Mm -hmm. And in today's technologically advanced society, the ability to do math is even more of a necessity than it used to be. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Professor Zakarsik, and thank you for coming to our show. Thank you, Sarah. If you wish to know more about the remedial math courses, stop into the testing center in the library building on campus or go to ocean.edu and click on first year students at the bottom of the page. When we come back, we'll meet with two very dedicated remedial English professors who will give us their perspective on the importance of developmental courses and how to succeed in being a good writer. Don't go anywhere.
You're watching Ocean TV 20. And we're back with Currents. With me now are OCC's remedial English professors, Dr. David Bordelon and Dr. Lynn Kramer Saracusa. Hello, and welcome to our show. Hi. 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 Dr. Bordelon, for those who don't know, what is the developmental program at Ocean County College? Sure. It's a series of courses designed to prepare students for college level reading and writing. Um, at OCC we have two levels of classes. The first is English 091. It consists of uh, emphasis on shorter readings and on shorter writing assignments, generally the paragraph length. The second uh, a course in the sequence is English 095 and it consists of longer writings and also longer readings. You're really in that course working towards uh, your essay length development. Great. So how long has the program existed at the college? It's been here pretty much from the inception. Uh, there was a major change in the 1990s when it went from a credit-bearing class to a non-credit-bearing class. And that is because the New Jersey uh, Board of Higher Education uh, said that, or ruled that, because it wasn't a college-level class, it couldn't uh, count for college-level credit. And that's also when it earned the designation of a zero before the course. Okay. So Dr. Syracuse, what is your professional background and how did you know that you first wanted to enter education? I entered college right out of high school um, and I was focused on business and accounting as my major uh, until I took a course in great books and within that semester, that course, I discovered my love of literature so I decided to change majors, become an English major. I transferred to Seton Hall University to pursue my bachelor degree um, and I thought I would work in publishing. But as graduation drew near, I decided to go back to school and earn a master's in English literature, also from Seton Hall. And it was in that master's program that I decided that teaching was the route that I really wanted to pursue. So I graduated and started applying for, for teaching jobs, um, both in high school and higher ed, um, and ended up in higher ed, obviously. And just last year, I completed my doctorate in educational leadership with a focus in higher ed. Excellent. So how long have you been at the college? I've been here for eight years now. Okay. And Dr. Bordelon, what is your professional background and how did you know that you first wanted to enter in? To education? Sure. Um, I started, uh, I guess, different from Professor Syracuse. Um, I did not go directly from um, high school to college. I ended up working for several years. I had various jobs. I worked uh, for a landscape nursery. I worked in warehouses and even cleaned swimming pools. But the whole time I was always reading and thinking and always knew that I wanted to pursue college, but I wasn't quite ready yet. So I eventually started in New Orleans. Um, I earned my uh, bachelor's from the University of New Orleans and then came up north to New York City for my graduate work. I have a master's in English from Hunter College and I earned a doctorate in English from uh, CUNY Graduate Center. Okay, and how long have you been at the college? I've been here for 20 years. Excellent. Yeah. So, Dr. Syracuse, why do you feel that the developmental program is so important and why is writing such an essential part of student lifelong success? I think the developmental writing program is essential because our students come to us with such a wide range of reading and writing abilities and the developmental program is really in place to support the students in developing this, these skills that are important to them across disciplines. Developmental reading and writing is housed in the English department but they're not skills that are unique to the English department. They're skills that students will use in all areas of their lives and in um, all areas of their studies. And so it's, it's very important that we provide that support so the students are able to succeed. Great. So what do you feel, Dr. Bordelon, is the greatest distinction between college level remedial courses and similar courses offered at the high school level? That's a good question. I think um, one of the major distinctions is time. Uh, in high school, you would have the whole year to work on, on a particular course. Mm -hmm. In college, uh, we have semesters divided into 15 weeks, 10 weeks, or even five weeks. So the workload, I believe, is a little more intensive, and it requires students to do a lot more work outside of class. Students in college need to work more at home generally, and generally the workload is a little faster and a little heavier than it would be in uh, high school. Dr. Saracusa, there is a common um, negativity you know, or a negative connotation attached to developmental courses. Can you comment on that? 
I think a lot of the students come in and they perceive the developmental courses as a roadblock to the courses that they want to take for their major or as a roadblock to earning their degree. It's going to take them more time. Um, they also have financial concerns about paying for the courses uh, that add to the number of credits that they need to take. But what is important is that the students recognize that these aren't set up as roadblocks to deter them, but as, as um, support systems to give them the ability to succeed in the other courses that they are taking for their major um, and in the gen ed requirements. Um, and that once they see the value in the skills that they're learning, that some of that negativity uh, falls away. Great. So what are some what are some of your teaching strategies that you implement in the classroom to kind of promote success and reduce that anxiety? At the beginning of the semester, I ask my students to tell me in writing how they feel about the class, and then I use that information to uh, begin a dialogue with them about how they feel and the value of the skills that they're going to be learning over the semester. Beginning last fall of 2014, uh, Veronica Guevara Lovgren, who's the coordinator of academic support, and I partnered to bring supplemental instruction to the developmental courses that I teach. Uh, supplemental instruction was created originally for use in STEM courses that were traditionally challenging courses for students in the majors to pass. We adapted that model with the help of, of, of others uh, to bring it to the developmental reading and writing courses. And so within my classes, I have a trained supplemental instruction leader who is a student, uh, and she sits in on the class, and she takes notes, and she interacts with the students as a peer. And once a week outside of class, she holds voluntary um, review sessions for the students to work on some of the skills that we've been working on in class. And it gives them you know, a bonding experience and additional time on task. Um, and they're fun and they're interactive and the students are responding very, very positively uh, to that experience and it's motivating for them to see the progress. Great, so Dr. Bordelon, so what are your, some of your techniques that you implement to kind of um, promote student success? Um, I try to do a lot of work in class, so students uh, will get a start with a particular writing assignment or sometimes even a reading assignment in class. If they have questions, I can address them right away. I also try to give a lot of feedback both in class and on work that's submitted outside of class. So they're constantly understanding what it is that they need to work on uh, in their writings. We'll do a lot of planning in class so the students aren't faced with that blank screen because I think a lot of students are really concerned and they freeze up when they have to have when they realize they have to actually put something on that screen. So we do a lot of prep work in class and I think that kind of eases some of the um, anxiety that they might have. Great. Dr. Saracusa, what are your secrets to successful teaching? I think the most important thing is is to get to know the students and to listen to the students um, and understand where they're coming from and the nice thing about teaching a writing course is, is that's pretty easy. Students reveal a lot of things in their writing. We have a lot of discussions um, and so that I am always kind of trying to stay aware of where my students are and what they understand and, and sort of maintain a comfort level that the students can say, wait, hold on a minute, I don't understand that um, or could we go over that again? Um, and having the SI leader in there really enables that because a lot of, there's a lot of interaction between myself, the SI leader, and then the students, and so I'm getting information from a lot of different sources. Okay. And Dr. Bordelon, what does it take for a student to be, what is necessary for a student to be successful in your class? Mm. I think students need to come in um, with what Carol Dweck from Stanford University calls an open mindset, and it's an awareness that you're going to grow, that you're not set in a particular way. So, for instance, if you do a particular writing assignment and it doesn't work out so well from you, as opposed to beating yourself up or saying, oh, well, I can't write, you realize, oh, well, I didn't do so great on this one. Let me see what I did wrong and what can I do to improve this for the next time. So that kind of growth mindset, I think, is really important for students. And the best thing, um, Professor Dweck's research shows that students can learn it. You're not born with either growth mindset or not growth mindset. You can actually learn and teach yourself that, yeah, I can beat this. I, I, I have the confidence and I have the tenacity to go forward and uh, excel in this particular area. Great. So, Dr. Saracusa, why is it that some students, in your opinion, 
like writing and some dislike it so much? I think a lot of it has to do with their past experiences, things they've been told or, or maybe things that were not specifically said to them but they've internalized. A lot of students will come in and say, I'm not good at writing or I've never been good at English. Um, and that's a hard thing to overcome and so I think a, a big part of the developmental classes is showing the students that they, they can do it, that it's not something that you're born with, it's something that takes practice. It's like riding a bike or tying your shoes, you have to learn how to do it and there are steps and, su and support to do it but I think a lot of it really comes from their past history. Okay and with regard to support, Dr. Bordelon, what resources are available at Ocean County College to support developmental students? Well, we have a great resource in the Writing Center. It's located in the Russell Building and it's staffed by very experienced instructors and tutors who meet one-on-one -on -one with students. You have trained tutors there, trained instructors that will sit and work for a half an hour, uh, sometimes you can even schedule longer uh, periods if they're available. And students just need to go uh, go down there and sign in on a computer and then they can uh, work with a tutor. And the instructors there can help them with everything from beginning assignment to proofreading it. So it really is kind of one-stop shopping for the students to get help with their writing. Some students, some of them love it so much, they'll say they live in the writing center while they're taking the class because they find it so helpful. Right. So my last question, Dr. Syracuse, where do you see the future of developmental education? I think there's always going to be a place for developmental education. Uh, it, it needs to evolve and adapt to the types of students that, that we're seeing, but there will always be students who don't have college level reading and writing skills for a variety of reasons. Um, I'd like to see more of it take place in the high schools, but there is some level of the nature of a teenager just not valuing um, what their teachers are, are trying to help them learn and so they may come out with weak skills and so there's always going to be you know a need for it and a place for it. There's currently a trend to speed up the remediation process um, and, and get students into credit bearing courses quicker and I certainly think that should be an option for some students uh, but learning skills takes time and so I think the future of developmental education is really providing a variety of different options for the students so they can proceed at, at a pace that's, that works for them and that, that um, will develop the necessary skills within those particular students. Uh, but I think an important component of it is, is the face-to-face -face interaction with faculty and classmates. Keep our focus on the students and adapt and evolve and provide opportunities and maybe a variety of, of options for students to complete their developmental work as they progress through their college careers. Excellent. Well, thank you, Dr. Lynn Kramer Saracusa, and thank you, Dr. Bordelon. Thanks for coming to our show. Thank you. Thank you. If you want to know more about the Remedial English courses, stop into the Testing Center in the Library Building on campus or go to ocean.edu and click on First Year Students at the bottom of the webpage. When we come back, we'll hear from OCC's athletic directors who are actively involved in organizing the upcoming NJCAA's Women's National Soccer Tournament this November. Stay with us. You are watching Ocean TV 20. Welcome back to Currents. The National Junior College Athletic Association, also known as NJCAA, has chosen our campus to host the largest collegiate women's soccer tournament in the U.S. Schools from all over the country will compete for the number one title and the chance to become the national champion. We had the opportunity to talk with college's athletic director, A.J. Trump, and executive director, Eileen Cohen. The tournament is the NJCAA Division III Women's Soccer National Championship. As far as the interest in soccer, after the World Cup and as well as the previous Olympics, there's been a tremendous change in the sport of soccer and the interest in the community. And I think here locally, it'll definitely influence the interest. There will be eight districts represented in the tournament. Teams from the Midwest, Texas, uh, upstate New York, New England, uh, Maryland, New Jersey. All over the country will be, will be coming here to, to participate in the tournament. Uh, there's a lot that goes into the event. Uh, you know, we have to secure 
hotels for the teams that are coming. Uh, we have to get out into the community. There's a lot of key people involved on campus as well as off campus. You have security, you have safety, you have grounds, you have facilities, accounting, obviously the athletic department. We have the TV crew, we have you know internet access which will be going live for each game. So there's a lot involved through the president and his staff on campus and we all work as a team. Uh, you know, being junior college, having only two years of players, every year the teams change, every year the teams are different, so it's anybody's game right now. There will be pre-admission tickets well, that will be discounted, which would be available online. If you're coming to just one day, one game, there's separate daily event prices. Parking here, where the campus has got a lot of parking all over, and we're going to separate parking for teams and officials and spectators in one area. The tournament's happening November 12th through 15th. There will be four games on Thursday, November 12th. There will be four games Friday, November 13th. And there will be three games, including the national championship, on Sunday, November 15th. We love the community, uh, bringing everybody together, showing the teamwork that this college is capable of is something that we're really excited about and we can't wait to showcase the, our beautiful campus and the beautiful Jersey Shore. Playing host for the next two years, the NJCAA's Women's Soccer Tournament will without a doubt allow OCC to take its place on the national stage. The games will be streaming live on the internet and broadcast live on Ocean TV 20. If you wish to know more about the Women's Soccer Tournament, stop into the Athletics Department located in the Health and Human Performance Center on campus or log on to ocean.edu and click on the Athletics tab. The OCC Jazz Band, under the direction of Professor David Marowitz, will close our show with their recent performance at the Three Sails Jazz Festival. These young musicians are just a sample of the many talents of the students that attend our college. OCC will continue to expand its boundaries and lead the way with innovative programs in education, athletics, and the arts. Make sure to tune in to our next edition to see where the currents take us right here on Ocean TV 20. I'm your host, Sarah Rivello, and as always, thanks for watching.